Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Work Inspired Podcast. I'm your host, George Lucas Pfeiffer, and today you're going to hear about the greatest internship ever. Now, I wish this was my idea, but at least you're hearing it from me. Get ready today for some new ideas and sparks of inspiration because we're talking about change, transformation, technology, and imagining the future. Such a privilege to be speaking with John Tomic, Managing Director for Slalom. You're going to love this episode, so let's get started. John, thanks so much for for being here, for speaking with us. We're so excited to have you on the show today. Pleasure to be here, George. Really been looking forward to this. So let's uh, let's start by uh, getting a little background on you and your professional experience. Tell them, give me the Cliff Notes version of your of your career to date. Sure. Um, well, it's had quite a lot of twists and turns, but um, you know, I, I've always been in the you know telecommunications and technology industry. And uh, I actually started off at Philips uh, way back in the day, uh, working in customer service. Uh, and you know that may not feel like technology and telecommunications, but uh, we were doing a lot of really interesting innovation uh, to try and drive different experiences for our customers. Um, but from there, I did switch into kind of core telecommunications. I worked for a company called Vertec, mm-hmm. and we were an outsource provider for complex provisioning. Uh, within the telecommunications industry. Um, so I had a lot of fun creating offerings for uh, the big telcos, uh, working with uh, with them to develop new processes and efficiencies around service delivery. Um, but then from there, uh, I moved to Seattle and joined a company called Synchronous. And we were a uh, a big outsourcer for, uh, within again, the telecommunications industry for the big carriers helping to activate and provision uh, phones, specifically cell phones. And that actually uh, brought me to uh, a really fun time in my career where I got to be a part of the original iPhone launch, um, Mm. which that was uh, amazing. And really the moment in my career where I realized that I had a passion around innovation and creation and taking a product and making it better or an experience and making it better. Um, so I did that for a number of years, worked, worked there. Um, and then after a while, uh, I found my way over to slalom and slalom is a consulting company that specializes in strategy, technology, and transformation in very many industries. And I'm a managing director within our global strategy strategy team today. And that's been amazing over the last several years because I I just have a real passion in helping my customers explore what's out there in the world and help them create that vision which and, and plan for how to realize their futures. And so a lot of it is very creative. A lot of it is really trying to understand the worlds of today and tomorrow and try and bring them to life. So that's the Cliff Notes version. That's a great setup for what we're here to talk about. And it's I'm excited for this one because we do tell a number of stories on this show. But this one's, I think, very, very cool. Uh, The best internship ever. I want to hear about this project that you recently did and um, and and what we've what what we can learn from it. Why don't you tell me set the stage a little bit? You're you're at Slalom. You got you're you're dealing with things like technology and transformation and strategy. What is the what what was the best internship ever project? Yeah. So. First of all, before I even, you know, kind of get into the details, I just, you know, I, it, this is this is a theme I'll, we'll, we'll come back to, I'm sure, later on when we talk. Um, but I, I just have to be, give huge kudos to Slalom in general, uh, mm. especially our CEO, Brad Jackson, because I think that one of the most important things that a company can do is just explore and mm. look for opportunities to just go out there and, and, and find creative ways of, of exploring things that you don't have good answers for. Mm. So, so in, in some of the work that we do, like I mentioned, I, I have a passion for, you know, thinking about the future, Mm. uh, and helping customers to do the same. And so I've been working with a number of customers to do just that at pretty exciting levels. And we've been painting a viewpoint of what the world of 2030 and beyond is going to look like. 
and doing it in a very creative way with our customers. And so uh, I found myself one day in our CEO, Brad's office, giving him a debrief about what we're doing with customers because we found it pretty exciting. And I know he would find it too. And we were reviewing some of the materials that, that, uh, that we were working with our customers on. And I had a slide in there, which was a kind of a, uh, a safe harbor type of slide. It's, it's the, it's the kind of a slide that you really kind of use as a get out of jail free card on, uh, on these types of conversations and saying, Hey, you know, we're about to go and try and predict the future. Mm -hmm. And that's really, really hard. And so uh, basically don't sue me if I get it completely wrong. Um, <laughs> but on this slide, I actually had some pictures of some of my favorite science fiction movie themes. And, you know, by the way, I'm a huge science fiction fan. So, you know, I had a picture of Captain Kirk with a, with a communicator. I had a picture from 2001 Space Odyssey, something from Blade Runner around advertising. And the whole point of that slide was actually to convey the message that predicting the future is really hard, but there is a group that does it very, very well. And that's Hollywood. Mm. The film industry has actually been predicting the future and bringing it to life on screen for us for decades. And um, so anyway, that was the concept of the slide. And I was trying to move to the next slide and Brad just stopped me in my tracks and said, hey, let's talk about this for a second because that's really, really fascinating. And so we got, I found myself into a conversation with Brad about using Hollywood as a bit of a proxy for trying to predict the future. And could we do the same with our clients? Mm. And so, you know, partway through the conversation, we were deep in chat about, you know, whether we could do this or not. And he just turned to me at one point and said, what if I were to give you 20 interns and all you did was watch sci every science fiction movie ever made? And then we cataloged that and we used that information strategically to help, you know, kind of amplify this type of engagement with our clients. And you know, of course you're sitting in the CEO's office and you're looking at him going like, that's a brilliant idea. That's really awesome. And I'm really believing that this is an amazing opportunity, but in the back of my mind, I'm thinking this can't be real, <laughs> like, you know? And so, but that was the genesis of the moment. And so I left his office that day, uh, half confused about whether we should do this, half confused of whether we should, you know, it was just a cool moment in the office with our, with our CEO. And, uh, I went over and had a conversation with a couple of colleagues of mine and we came to the conclusion that he was probably serious. And so we did it. We hired a number of University of Washington students. Um, uh, and, you know, it was, it, that was a story of, uh, unto itself. We actually had put a job posting out there, which was, in, you know, enveloped in intrigue and mystery. Basically, mm -hmm. you know, are you um, do you like science fiction and what's your favorite science fiction film and why? And it went viral among the <laughs> university system. And so we had hundreds of people coming to us asking to, you know, be part of this effort. And we had to choose, we had the hard task of choosing, you know, 10 or so. So we formulated the team and we started watching movies and we had our movie list, by the way, we have an awesome movie list if you ever want to see it. And I would like to see it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's probably the most asked for thing about, about this internship is what were the movies <laughs> that we watched. And it was everything. It was everything from Metropolis, which was, you know, an old black and white uh, film from decades ago that was basically the first science, you know, considered to be one of the first science fiction films that were created all the way to the kind of modern blockbusters. Mm -hmm. And we cataloged everything you know, everything from the technologies that we saw to the feelings that we had, the context around it. And we just treated it as a big research project. Yeah, there's a it couple of things. Fun. There's, there, I mean, first of all, yes, obviously to have a job where you can sit and watch movies is just seems like a dream. Um, that, I was thinking a lot about this since the last time we talked and it's very, it seems obvious when you set it up that way. I mean, we're in the commercial interiors industry and creating a, a, a creating a physical space can be a sizable investment. So one of the things our design team is very, you know, capable of doing is using technology to help clients visualize a space that doesn't yet exist so they can get a feel for what that future state might look like. And they can make changes based off of that, that visualization. And so you're doing something, I mean, Hollywood, obviously they spend a lot of money and a lot of time and have a lot of resources and they do it very well. So you're taking this, this great 
you know, abundance of films that already are out there. And you're basically saying, let's analyze these because that's the other piece is the scientific part, the data, you know, and, and that's what I'm fascinated about is like when you get into, I mean, the, quit the coolness of watching fil films as an internship aside, what were you guys trying to, what was the kind of the end goal? Was it just to say we saw 20 examples of teleportation or what, what were you going to try to do with that data once it was collected? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And one that we really didn't have a great answer for when mm. we started out, which is, which is why I, you know, kind of when I, when I say I'm really just so thankful that I work for a place that really values exploration at the core, just pure exploration. Yeah. We weren't sure what we were looking for, hmm. but we knew that it was important. And we mm. knew that there were some really interesting things that we were probably going to find and discover and talk about and explore. Um, you know, the, there were a couple of things that we did know that we, we had theories around. I mean, number one, part of the whole premise of, of why we did this and why we're helping customers really look towards the future is that the future is coming really fast mm -hmm. and tech. Yeah. And technology has been on this, you know, kind of roller coaster, high speed, accelerated pace for a number of years and is only getting faster. And so our clients are recognizing that and they are looking for us to help them look beyond the headlights to to the future farther out into the future to try and not be caught off guard and to think mm -hmm. broader and to think bigger so so there was that element of that um you know i think i think another another aspect of this was um there's value in actually doing research in this space because we know that everything is changing. I mean, if you just look at any industry and if last year was, was just the perfect example of this with COVID, you know, COVID comes along and, and changes a lot of what companies are, or how they're operating or what they're even doing sometimes. And we were starting to hear a number of themes around this. Like it's not that COVID necessarily changed our thought process, but it definitely accelerated some things and brought mm -hmm. things more towards the present that were in the future. So this process of looking at the future with uh, different perspectives and trying to make sense of that or, or try to analyze that or try to predict it is something mm -hmm. that we thought was really interesting. I do love the fact that you were able to start this project and had the freedom to try something that you didn't actually have. You didn't know exactly where it was supposed to, let, to land, right? Um, have you been able to distill down the, the, the effort into some kind of key takeaways? We have. And well, we're still learning. So first of <laughs> all, it's, you know, we we have a ton of data now, which is, you know, that's that's fun in itself just to see what we can do with the information and data that we've collected already. Um, but some of the key takeaways are not necessarily like, you know, kind of clear breakthroughs, sure. you know, like we, we're not, we didn't stumble upon the next, next iPhone, for example, the next but, iPhone, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. But what, what I found really interesting were some of the themes that we explored. Mm -hmm. So how can you take a, uh, utopian lens and apply it towards thinking of the future? How can you take a dystopian lens and apply that towards thinking about the future. What if an external force comes in as a disruptor to a vision that you have? And have we seen examples of that? And can we learn from those from the films that we watched? You know, mm. I, you know, one of my interns said something that I thought was really profound in this whole study. Um, he said that, you know, Hollywood is really good at showing us the tension between events. Like, you know, there's, there's something that happens and it's a great storyline that that's in a film, but the tension around like say privacy versus, um, you know, just, just availability of a service. Mm -hmm. That's a tension that we're dealing with today and finding out where the boundaries are of how you should think about that is a really important discussion. One that companies are dealing with today. Mm -hmm. So, if nothing else, that's also a skill that we're learning a little bit from the movie industry about in how to help customers of ours work through those tensions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think 
I mean, you 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 obviously said that there, we're on a bit. There's a roller coaster effect happening, but with I think COVID and the last twelve months, there's been an acceleration, especially with the technology component when it relates to kind of the concept of imagining the future. Where are we going to be at? Let's not even say five years from now. Let's say like we're going to be at five months from now. You know, w what can companies do to be more accurate or to be more effective if they're trying to put together a strategy for how they're going to effectively come out of what has been a massive amount of change and disruption that we've faced over the last 12 months? Yeah, so it's a great question. I, you know, the, you know, if COVID has taught us anything, it's that, you know, things can change and pretty mm -hmm. dramatically. And so, you know, there's a little bit of safety and creativity. There's also some safety in partnerships. And mm -hmm. I think that um, COVID was, you know, to use a movie example, it might've been the warp bubble that brought us into the future a little bit. And, you know, it's funny, um, just this acceleration concept. I had a conversation, you know, when everything was locking down and everyone was, you know, kind of stuck at home and dealing with this about this time last year, um, with a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, uh, who is very progressive in the augmented virtual mixed reality field. In fact, he's one of the leading experts in the world. Hmm. And he made a comment to me that, you know, he felt like the world just caught up with him. Hmm. which was, which was interesting because this is the world he lives in. And, you know, it's the, the concepts of virtual education or telehealth or, you know, using entertainment in more of a, you know, kind of an augmented way are things that he's been living with for years. And he is a futurist. He is hmm. one that really looks towards the future of these technologies and tries to embrace them wholeheartedly. Um, and the fact that, you know, he's, you know, the world has caught up to him, you know, in his words, uh, I think is kind of a good indication of what just happened. And, you know, it, it, when I reflect on COVID a little bit, I, I think about I, it's, it's tragic what, what is going on right now, but from a glass half full perspective, I think it's also giving us a little bit of a, you know, kind of a special gift in a way it's, it's what I've observed is that it's allowing companies the freedom and the permission to be creative and to mm. take the rules of yesterday and put them aside and allow yourself to kind of think freely about what could be instead of mm. being confined to what is. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because when you think back to your, your, you know, your movie project, um, those were all movies that were created in the past. Obviously you weren't getting some special you know, access to something that's being created now or tomorrow. No. And they were no. imagining a future, maybe a distant future or, you know, I mean, at different lengths. And in fact, some of them were probably futures that had already happened, you know, cause they were older movies and we'd already come and gone from the times they were predicting. But I, I think the idea of, uh, future state versus current state is is important here. You know, like you just talked about you, you're the futurist friend of yours. I'd be interested to know if he's basking in the fact that now he's, you know, everybody's uh, kind of enjoying the technologies he's been pushing that, you know, people were saying, oh, that's not, we're not ready for that yet. Or is he saying, all right, I need to start looking at what's, what, what's the future from here? You know, like uh, they've caught up to me. Now I need to get another step ahead so I can blaze that trail. How important is it to understand where we're at now in order to better imagine where we could, should, or might be in the future? Yeah, it's it, that's a great question. I mean, I, I think it's really important to understand where you are now, if nothing else, than to just take stock in what your assets or your capabilities are. Mm. So, you know, when we have these conversations with our clients, that's part of it. You know, we, mm. we spend some time with them, uh, really taking a look at how things work today with them. And, you know, there's things that work well, there's things that maybe don't work so great, but all of those are assets and mm -hmm. they're realities. And so, you know, where I think this gets fun and why that's important to do is because an element that I think is just, you know, kind of underrated and, you know, in my opinion, one of the most exciting things to do is to take a current asset or a current situation and evolve it. And so, mm -hmm. you know, how do you do that? You know, you can use the future or something that you see in a film or something that a competitor is doing as inspiration that would kind of unlock that creativity and mm. that creativity could be, you know, it, it could be of different flavors. It could be creativity because you're worried about a competitor doing something, or you're worried about, you know, an industry that is changing and you're not changing with it. 
or it could be a situation that, you know, I mean, I was in conversations with some companies when, again, about this time last year that were very much benefiting from the situation and, but we're having different kinds of challenges about how to deal with the unexpected volumes of such. Mm -hmm. And so they had to start thinking differently about their businesses. Mm -hmm. So knowing a little bit about today is, is I, I think it's critical. It's also uh, an important piece because, you know, unless you're going to go out and create something brand new, which is also very fun to do. Um, a lot of the kind of the best innovations are things that aren't necessarily completely brand new. They're just evolutions of the things that exist today that provide better value. Yeah. I, th I liked how you said, you know, that your advice on where a company can start is to kind of work together, right? To talk, have conversations, to, to, to consider partnerships. And maybe that's not just with other people or other firms, but that's with technologies that are emerging or uh, are, are, are starting to hit the market. I think during our planning call, you talked about how you guys are looking at 5G and that technology and trying to see how would some of these futuristic, you know, uh, concepts that are, that were imagined in, in past Hollywood films, how would they work on a 5g network? Is that, is that part of the, is that part of the puzzle is to say, we've got an idea, let's look at what's coming or what's maybe here now and saying, do we have what we, do we have the tools needed to make this reality right today? Yeah. And that's, that's actually my, uh, the thing I'm most excited about when I think about the future is, is, you know, how do you take something? And again, we, you know, 5g is here, you know, and it's, it's, but it is still early. Mm -hmm. And, um, the thing that I've observed is that there's a lot of confusion about the value that, uh, could even be achieved with it. Like it's still, you know, it's, it is a big leap forward, uh, technically speaking, and there's a little bit of ambiguity around the use cases of this or the business model that, that, you know, how this is all going to kind of work in the future. So, you know, I, I am also a big fan of experimentation and exploration when it comes to technology. So, you know, we're going to go down the path of trying to bring clarity to the use cases that can be enabled by 5G networks or other types of networks and bring those to customers and use those as catalysts or, you know, further inspiration to try and take what their thoughts might be even further into the future. Hmm. And we're excited. Yeah. We don't know exactly where that's going to go either, but you know, I think it's just going to be extremely fun to tie both the internship with what we're doing, you know, kind of technically speaking, practically speaking with some network technology to maybe try and bring some of the concepts that were in the science films to life a little mm -hmm. bit and see how far we can take those. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, that meeting with your, your CEO is, you know, in his office and him saying, well, what if I just give you 20 interns? You know, like it sounds, yeah. that sounds, you know, it sounds great. Uh, what do you say though, when you work with a client or to any, any business leaders that are listening saying, I just, I can't afford to do that. I can't, I've got, I'm basically trying to keep my lights on. I'm trying to, I, I can't, I can't afford to think about tomorrow because if I don't think about today, there won't be a tomorrow. Or maybe the the less dire way of saying that is we want to be cutting edge, not bleeding edge. Uh, how does a company balance that appetite for risk, for imagination, for that uncertainty with the realistic I've got to, I've got to make sure that I'm still paying my bills. You know, I've got to make sure the revenue is st still coming in. What, what advice would you have for somebody thinking down, going down that train of thought? Well, I can relate to that for sure. Um, and I think that, you know, there, there is no, I mean, you have to take care of, you know, what's in front of you and, and the daily operations. That's just, that's a given. And so, mm -hmm. Um, I personally, the advice I would give is that it's about balance and, mm -hmm. you know, just like it's important to save for a rainy day, it's important to explore for a future that may be unknown. And so, you know, do you have to create an entire business unit that does this? No. Do you, should you incorporate this into some, you know, weekend retreat, uh, or, or, uh, a session that, you know, allows you the permission to go and explore the, you know, some concepts that are, you know, a little out there. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there are ways of doing this that are not going to break the bank. 
Um, you know, and, and the beauty about the time that we're living in, I think, is that I think there's a realization that of the importance of exploration and you know, partnering with, with companies that are doing innovation and in technologies. Mm -hmm. And there are companies that are looking to invest in that type of uh, relationship right now. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And I think, I think an important part of what you're saying is that you just have to have the intent to do it. There's ways to do it. And there's, there's going to be a, there's a, there's a, uh, there, any company could figure out a way to do it. Maybe some would go in a little bit deeper into the pool and some would just wait in. But if you're not intending to do it, if it's not, if it's not part of your strategy, then it's not going to happen and you're not going to benefit from, from, from the opportunity. So I, I do like that a lot. Now, like, let's look at it a different way. Uh, t type of company, large organizations, I think sometimes have the capital and maybe they have an entire team that's just there to think about the future and come up with innovation, you know, and then startups that, that might be their entire business model. They, you know, that's maybe why some startups come and go so quickly, you know, is they've got an idea and they're riding on it and it could be a home run or it could be a strikeout. What do you say to, um, the rest of the companies, you know, the ones that aren't so big that they have a dedicated team and the ones that are established enough that they're not just a concept. Uh, like, for example, let's say you owned a citrus farm, you know, is can you can we apply the, the learnings that, that you, you know, the takeaways from your best internship ever and apply them to companies outside of the big the big ones and the, the tiny startups? George, you got me on that one. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, for probably for the benefit of your audience, uh, you know, I am the owner and founder of a uh, company called Arvor Deleuze as well. And we're a small business in the citrus industry. So that's the reference. Uh, I, you know, I, um, I don't think that thinking to the future and, you know, exploration, imagination, and especially within technology in this day and age should be isolated to the big the big mm -hmm. companies like this is this is an opportunity. It's almost an imperative for smaller companies as well to think about this. And again, a very pragmatic example is look at what happened this last year. Those mm -hmm. companies that didn't have a digital presence were ones that really struggled when things started to lock down. And so there was a mad scramble to just get a website launched or delivery services created or, you know, things that we could do in this environment for survival. And I think that, you know, not to, not to say that it, you could have predicted this, but, you know, having, having this be part of a methodology that a company goes through, um, frequently, you know, it, not just once a year in, in a retreat, but, you know, frequently throughout the year, um, to think about the future and explore big concepts and do a little bit of, you know, kind of crazy, exploration of, of wild ideas is just paramount because mm. if you don't, there are others who are, and that's mm -hmm. the, that's the thing that I think a lot of companies need to remember that, you know, it, it won't be long before digital is everything. And mm -hmm. that that's a world where if you're not ready for it, um, you could struggle. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, just it, practically you brought up citrus, you know, and so what is citrus? What can you do thinking about the future of citrus? Uh, you know, we are doing things uh, with sustainability, which, you know, I mean, that is that's an area that I think every company should be exploring as well. And, and companies are going down the path of mandating that, you know, other companies that they partner with or provide services to. Uh, have and have a sustainability practice um, mm -hmm. and and do things in a sustainable manner. So, in a way, that that is another catalyst that forces companies to think about the future, to think about things that perhaps are not there today, and then bring them into the current present and at least start working on them. Yeah, that's a great example. A future state because if you're not if you're not looking after the planet, there might not be that future state that. that I love it. Um, I, I, I'm trying to figure out how to even ask this question because it's, it's even hard to form, but it, it, the, the idea of, of change being something that, I mean, we all just went through a ton of change, right? No matter if you liked, wanted to, or wanted, you know, liked it or not, everybody experienced change with the pandemic. 
is change something that's good to experience and then reflect on and hone and 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 kind of like make it right or is change more of a snowball where with with once it starts you adapt and you get used to change and you get more comfortable with change and you and you look forward to change and it's just part of your culture and part of your organization is it do you kind of see change being most effective as like a uh, an up and down, or is it something that's more of a trajectory where we've talked about the accelerated rate of change? Is there a, it, or, or is it somewhere in the middle? Whereas it's like, depending on the type of change, you know, some change is, is better s served in phases and some is just, it's more of a strategic thought process in which you should continue to build upon. Yeah. Lots to think about there. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I think, you know, so let me, let me, take a step back and just think about the word change itself. So mm -hmm. fundamentally, I think change is good. You know, a mm -hmm. lot of people are afraid of change, um, but change is very, very good. What, what I think about with your question is how do you deal with change is probably mm -hmm. a really important concept. And so, you know, I'm not, I, I love the snowball analogy because I think it's probably something like that. Like, it's not mm -hmm. like a big event that, you know, I mean, every once in a while you'll see a big event come along and that forces change. And that's, you know, those are the disruptions that everyone, you know, kind of talks about. Um, however, I think, I think the reality is, is that the change comes all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, you can, you can have a change of viewpoint. You could have a change in, uh, direction. There could be a change, an influencer change that comes along that, you know, kind of intercepts a plan that you might've had and have been really comfortable with. Um, mm -hmm. the, the important piece about this, I really do believe is, 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 is thinking about change proactively. And mm -hmm. that's why I'm, you know, a big fan of thinking about the future, because one of the exercises that you can do is actually try to disrupt yourself. And, you know, if you if you force change upon a situation, it forces you to think a little bit more broadly about what those changes could be and mm -hmm. how they influence a strategy or how they influence a direction or even a desire. So, you, you know, I, I hope this is answering you know the question a little bit, but it's it's a very subtle topic and, and one that I think needs a little bit of muscle memory to develop some some expertise in, in dealing with. Yeah, I agree. And and that's why I hesitated to ask it, because I think about the COVID situation as one of those big disruptors. I mean, it was right. And now as we hopefully are nearing the end of it, people are very much eager to go back to some normal to, to what some some sense of normalcy, right, to how it was before. And I think some of that is, I mean, very warranted. We want to see our loved ones. We want to go out in public, uh, and, you know, travel. But at the same time, you know, you use the you use the phrase glass half full. Does does a large disruptor like that set us up to better handle and leverage change on an ongoing basis? Are we coming out of this better prepared to real imagine and then realize our futures? You know, I, I think from a technology perspective, we probably are, you know, like we've been forced into a, a way of working with technology and look how it's disrupting medicine and, and education and just all these different industries. But it's interesting from a conceptual point of view, we don't like to change, you know, like we feel better being comfortably the same as we were. If we were happy, don't if it's not broke, don't fix it. Right. But at this the other way of looking at that, though, is that it changes the way we get to how we're going to be in the future and we, the way we innovate and improve. So, yeah, I, I, I don't think there is a necessarily an answer, but I think it's a, you said it's it's the intent. It's it's being proactive and exploring those concepts looking at the other, the ideas of others and, and looking at where we're at today to see how do we best get to where we're going to be at in the future. So I think it, I mean, it's such a cool project and it's so unique that I'm really, really grateful that you came on and told us about it. Um, I think, uh, uh, I'm sure there'll be people that want to learn more and, and, and maybe grab that movie list and, and, and dive into some of the takeaways. I love to finish the, the, the interview by just asking you a couple personal questions from your, you sure. know, from your professional standpoint as a business owner and a managing director. Um, has there been a resource that's been really valuable to you and your, you and your career that you'd be willing to share with others? 
Yeah, it's so without a doubt, it's people, um, mm. you know, and I, I think sometimes, you know, we, we tend to forget that as a resource, um, but whether it's coworkers or clients, competitors, even, mm -hmm. uh, anyone that I can sit next to on a plane, you know, coming back to San Diego that has a great story to tell to me. Um, my wife, who's been an inspiration for pr practically everything. I mean, I think there's so many people out there in the world that one can learn from and then really just iterate and, and challenge and be challenged by, um, you know, it's actually why this year has been such a challenge for, I think for me and a lot of people is, you know, it's, it's, I love hopping on a plane so that I can mm -hmm. sit in a room and have a conversation on a crazy far out topic. And, uh, you know, when I reflect on just what happened over the last year and I compare it to, you know, prior pandemics in the world, I just feel like we're so lucky right now to actually have the technology that's in place today that can create this kind of, a, I mean, look at what we're doing mm -hmm. right now on, on, on your show. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we're, we're still able to accomplish connection with today's communication technologies, but you know, frankly, nothing beats a good old face-to-face -face meeting with someone that you can have a great conversation with. Amen to that. Well, looking forward to that in the near future, hopefully, um, yeah. regarding leadership, is there a quality that you've seen is consistent across effective leaders? Um, you know, I, I, th I think everyone has their own style. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing that I find um, when I look at leaders who I just admire personally, it's, it's really the ability to listen. And I mean, mm -hmm. like really listen, like active listening, practice that day in, day out. They listen well. Um, it's something that I have learned over time, how important that is, because when you are interacting with people, some of them, you know, kind of the most unexpected, unexpected places that I've run into, you know, real exciting value just in life is when I listen and pay attention. And, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes it's not about just talking. You really just have to kind of zip it up and, and listen and you learn quite a bit. So like, like watching a movie, right? <laughs> exactly. There's a lot of value in watching a movie and listening. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. All right. Final question. Uh, if you were retiring today or, or handing the farm down to the future generation, what's uh -huh. a, what's a piece of wisdom that you'd want to pass on? Uh, so this is something I've actually been thinking quite about, uh, quite a bit about today. Um, you know, I've been lately working with a lot of early career, uh, individuals. And that's, that's something that, um, uh, especially the internship is a great example, right? I mean, these were, uh, college students that were just beginning their career. Um, their whole future was ahead of them. And, and it was, I had a little bit of an epiphany working with, you know, my interns, uh, over the last, you know, couple of years. And I realized that by working with the youth, you're actually seeing the future. Mm. You're seeing mm. by, by understanding their perspective, you get a little glimpse into what the future is actually going to be. And I'm just, I got really excited working with the team because you know, I mean, granted, we hired some of the best people out there, you know, I mean, really, really sharp minds and extremely creative thinkers. But um, that's what inspires me is I, I, I think the wisdom that I would pass on is, you know, don't be so confined to your core group that you overlook uh, mm -hmm. the youth of today because they are the future and you can get really interesting glimpses into what the future is going to hold by just listening to them. Such great advice. And I hope you prepare them for a future where they won't have a job as desirable as watching movies all day. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. John, John, this has been, this has been a pleasure. I love, I love the idea. I love the, the, the thought, um, just exploring some of these things is, it's so enjoyable. I, I, and, and I think they, uh, I mean, I'm envious of your citrus farm, but more so of the fact that you get to talk to people about future states, looking at transformation and technology, such a cool career. Um, 
I, I can't thank you enough for your insight and for being on this show. Thanks for your time. George, the pleasure was all mine. Really appreciate, you know, the opportunity to talk with you. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this conversation, please take a moment to rate our show. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the Work Inspired Podcast so that you don't miss any of the incredible guests we have planned for upcoming episodes. We'll continue to find the best and brightest minds in business so that you can learn, grow, and succeed, and so that we can all work inspired. Work Inspired is brought to you by BOS, a leader in commercial working environments and a Hayworth best-in-class dealership. Experience our 360 approach and discover the team, tools, and techniques required to navigate the complexity of your next workspace at bos.com. If you have ideas, feedback, or would like to be featured on our show, please email podcast at bos.com. Thank you for listening. This has been a Workspace Digital production. If you're interested in launching a podcast at your organization, please email info at workspace.digital for a free consultation.